So today I just wanted to talk about King Josiah, who was the boy king of Judah, and he was one of the best and most upright kings that of the Davidic line. So King Josiah, he was the 16th king of Judah. He ruled from, 6 of, from 640 BC to 609 BC, so it was 31 years. He was right in God's eyes. He did that which was right. And he was the last king of Judah that obeyed God and kept his commandments. And an interesting fact about Josiah is that after him, there would only be one more king of Judah. In fact, his own son, Jehoahaz, who would rule over Judah with any real power because after King Jehoahaz, all the kings after him would be puppets set up by Babylon and Egypt, respectively. So first, let's get into a little bit of background about King Josiah, about the things that were leading up, the events that were leading up to his reign. So just for some setting here, Manasseh, who we're about to talk about in Ammon, they were both, Manasseh was Josiah's grandfather and Ammon was his father. In 2 Chronicles 33, verse 1, Manasseh was 12 years old when he began to reign, and he reigned 50 and 5 years in Jerusalem. But he did that which was evil in the sight of the Lord, like unto the abominations of the heathen, whom the Lord had cast out before the children of Israel. So Manasseh, he served Balaam, and he served all the host of heaven, so worshipped stars, planets, moons, comets, etc., he also dealt with witchcraft and enchantments and with wizards and familiar spirits. And then near the end of his life, he actually humbled himself and served God and kept God's commandments for the last couple of years of his life. So interesting after all the evil that he'd committed, that he did that. That was definitely of the Lord. 2 Chronicles 33 verse 21. Ammon was two and 20 years old when he began to reign. And he reigned two years in Jerusalem. But he did that which was evil in the sight of the Lord, as did Manasseh his father. For Ammon sacrificed unto all the carven images which Manasseh his father had made and served them. So as just mentioned, Ammon served all the same images Manasseh served and committed the same sins. But he did not humble himself to the Lord. So he did not humble himself. He did not serve the Lord in his later years and was completely evil throughout his reign. This was the kingdom that Josiah inherited when he came to the throne. 2 Chronicles 34, verse 1. Josiah was eight years old when he began to reign, and he reigned th one and thirty years in Jerusalem. And he did that which was right in the Lord, and walked in the way of David his father, and declined neither to the right hand or to the left. For in the eighth year of his reign, while he was yet young, he began to seek after the God of David his father. And in the twelfth year, he began to purge Judah and Jerusalem from the high places and the groves and the carved images and the molten images. So Josiah served the Lord and obeyed his commandments, but he didn't actually learn of what would be Judah's fate until the eighteenth year of his reign. So about, so about 10 years down the line from when he started his reforms. And he had every opportunity to follow after the sins of his ancestors, but he did not. And he always stayed true to the Lord. Unwavering faith right there. That's, what that's an example of. Two Chronicles 34, verse eight. Now in the 18th year of his reign, when he had purged the land and the house, he sent Shaphan, the son of Azaliah, and Messiah, the governor of the city, and Joah, the son of Joahaz, the recorder, to repair the house of the Lord his God. Verse 14. And when they brought out the money that was brought into the house of the Lord, Hilkiah the priest found a book of the law of the Lord given by Moses. So this book... This book of the law that was mentioned, it would have been comprised of the five books of Moses, the Pentateuch, it was called. So Genesis, Exodus, 
Leviticus, Deuteronomy, and Numbers. And it would have mentioned that God would destroy Israel if they didn't obey his commandments, which is specifically referenced and specifically talked about in Numbers 26, verse 20 to 25. So Jude Chronicles 34, 18. Then Shaphan the scribe told the king, saying, Hilkiah the high priest hath given me a book. And Shaphan read it before the king. Verse 19. And it came to pass when the king had heard the words of the law that he rent his clothes. Then the king sent and gathered together all the elders of Judah in Jerusalem. And the king stood in his place and made a covenant before the Lord to walk after the Lord and to keep his commandments and his testimonies and his statutes with all his heart and with all his soul to perform the works of the covenant which are written in this book. And Josiah took away all the abominations out of all the countries that pertain to the children of Israel to make all that were present in Israel to serve, even to serve the Lord their God. In all his days, he departed not from following the Lord, the God of their fathers. So prior to initiating these reforms, Josiah had sent messengers to a prophetess to learn if what he had read would really happen, which is referenced and mentioned in 2 Chronicles 34, verse 20 to 28. The answer was yes, which was partially why he initiated these reforms. And one thing I should add is that Josiah was obedient to the Lord and served him even before these reforms, but he, would, he upped his game, so to speak, when he read the words of the law. So now go to 2 Kings 23, verse 4. And the king commanded Hilkiah the high priest and the priests of the second order and the keepers of the door to bring forth out of the temple of the Lord all the vessels that were made for Baal and for the grove and for all the host of heaven. And he burned them without Jerusalem in the fields of Kidron and carried the ashes of them unto Bethel. And he put down the idolatrous priests, which the kings of Judah had ordained to burn incense in the high places in the city of Judah and in the places round about Jerusalem. Them also that burned incense unto Baal, to the sun, and to the moon, and to the planets, and to all the host of heaven. And he brake down the houses of the Sodomites that were by the house of the Lord, where the women wove hangings for the grove. And he defiled Topeth, which is in the valley of the children of Hinnom, that no man might make his son or daughter to pass through the fire to Molech. And the altars that were on the top of the upper chamber of Ahaz, which the kings of Judah had made, and the altars which Manasseh had made in the two courts of the house of the Lord, did the king beat down and break them down from thence, and cast the dust of them into the brook Kidron. And the high places that were before Jerusalem, which were on the right hand of the Mount of Corruption, which Solomon, the king of Israel, had builded for Ashtoreth, the abomination of the Zidonians, and for Shemesh, the abomination of the Moabites, and for Milcom, the abomination of the children of Ammon, did the king defile. So these verses mentioned tell of some of the major reforms that Josiah initiated in his reign, as told in 2 Kings. Now beyond this, there are many, many more reforms which I didn't include for time's sake. But if you want to read about these reforms, there's information about them in 2 Kings 23, 1-4, and 2 Chronicles 35, 1-18, which list the complete reforms of King Josiah. So now we have Josiah's death. There are two different accounts of Josiah's death, one in 2 Kings and one in 2 Chronicles. First, we will look at the account in 2 Kings. 2 Kings 23, verse 29. In his days, Pharaoh Necho, king of Egypt, went up against the king of Assyria to the river Euphrates. And King Josiah went up against him, and he slew him at Megiddo when he had seen him. And his servants carried him in a chariot, dead from Megiddo, and brought him to Jerusalem, 
and buried him in his own sepulcher. And the people of the land took Jehoahaz, the son of Josiah, and anointed him, and made him king in his father's stead. So the pharaoh mentioned in this passage, Pharaoh Necho, is King Necho II of Egypt. We will come back to him in just a couple of slides. Now go to 2 Chronicles 35, verse 20, which is the other, which is the other account of Josiah's death. After all this, when Josiah had prepared the temple, Necho, king of Egypt, came up to fight against Carchemish by Euphrates, and Josiah went out against him. But he sent ambassadors to him, saying, What have I to do with thee, thou king of Judah? I come not against thee this day, but against the house wherewith I have war. For God commanded me to make haste. Forbear thee from meddling with God, who is with me, that he destroy thee not. Nevertheless, Josiah would not turn his face from him, but disguised himself, that he might fight with him, and hearkened not unto the words of Necho by the mouth of God, and came to fight in the valley of Megiddo. And the archers shot at King Josiah, and the king said to his servants, Have me away, for I am sore wounded. So at this point, it's the same as the last account. He was brought back to Jerusalem and dies there. So the Battle of Carchemish is a very significant battle in Bible prophecy, but the topic is so intense and so big that it's best saved for another presentation. So now we will look at the aftermath and what happens directly after the reign of King Josiah. Second Chronicles 36, verse 2. Jehoahaz was 20 and 5 years old when he began to reign, and he reigned three months in Jerusalem. And the king of Egypt put him down at Jerusalem and condemned the land in an hundred talents of silver and a talent of gold. So let's stop and think for a sec about how much money this is. So it's 100 talents of silver, which equates to about three tons of silver. And a talent of gold would have been about 33 pounds of gold. So this was an absolutely monumental sum of money that the king of Egypt was demanding Jehoahaz pay. And the king made Eliakim his brother, king over Judah and Jerusalem, and turned his name to Jehoiakim. And Necho took Jehoahaz his brother and carried him to Egypt. So after Jehoiakim was placed on the throne as a puppet, Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, invaded Jerusalem and looted the temple. After Jehoiakim's death, Jehoiachin, his son, so it's two different people, Jehoiakim and Jehoiachin. After Jehoiakim's death, Jehoiachin, his son, reigned for three months before Nebuchadnezzar captured Jerusalem and added it to the Neo-Babylonian Empire. This would eventually lead to the destruction of Jerusalem 11 years later, which was the discrep was, uh, excuse me, sorry about that, which was the destruction that God described in Numbers 26, if Israel should stop following his ways, which they did. So what can we learn from King Josiah? What's the point of all this? What is there to observe from him? What is there to learn from him? Well, actually, there's quite a lot that can be learned from King Josiah. King Josiah, he, these are just some of the things that I found inspiring about him. And these are some of the lessons that can be learned from him. Josiah declined neither to the right hand nor to the left, and he always stayed true to God. He never turned away from his God. Josiah stayed faithful to God, even after he knew that Israel would be destroyed and had faith no matter what. It's, in, it's also very inspiring that an eight-year-old values serving God. And this, this brings to mind Matthew 18, 3, which I think we could just turn to. Matthew 18, verse 3. And he said, this is Jesus speaking, Verily I say unto you, except ye be converted and become as little children, ye shall not enter into the kingdom of heaven. So... This is possibly what Jesus was referring to when he was 
speaking here. And this definitely this attitude would have been what he would have been referring to when he was saying, except you become as little children. And there's one more very impressive thing about Josiah. When there was a problem with Israel, which would be the sin and abominations caused by the previous kings, Josiah's own ancestors, Josiah didn't hesitate to fix it, even at the expense of his personal life and family life and physical possessions and life here on earth. Like Josiah did, we need to take action to fix problems within our kingdom, our soul and salvation, even at the expense of our natural life and family. Josiah was the perfect example of someone who is right with God, who's right in the Lord, and we should all follow his example to the best of our ability. And I thought I would leave it there. Praise the Lord. Now we can come 45 years into the future and I'm, I'm what Matthew will look like in 45 years. So anyway, I don't have any better jokes, I'm sorry. Just, just a couple of really simple points on some, some very well-known ground for us. And actually some of this was even mentioned in the gifts today. I just wanted to do uh, just a little brief study of Jude. Uh, the book of Jude, um, obviously chapter one if we can turn there. Um, Jude is uh, very similar to 2 Peter chapter 3. Um, there's very similar sort of language in it. There's very similar sort of, um, sort of uh, identifications. But the, the thing about Jude, and, and the one thing that I've, I've really loved was Jude was really sort of brief and to the point. And uh, to use a term that Pastor David always used, was he was uh, downright blunt about things. As, uh, as far as um, what was going on in the church at the time. I just want to sort of talk a little bit about the background here. Um, I've done a little bit of reading and you, you can sort of, sort, of, um, sort of surmise a little bit, um, if you will, about what was going on in, in the Middle East about this time. You had the, uh, the Roman, um, the, the, the Romans were pretty much dominant uh, power everywhere you went. Uh, there was very open persecution of Christians and Jews. At this point, the, the, uh, the temple had been destroyed and Jerusalem, Jerusalem had been sacked by the, uh, by the Romans. And there was an awful lot of, uh, of, of difficulties and strifes on the, on the, the planet. And there's a, there's a very similar parallel that we can draw today. I don't know if anybody reads or, or looks at the current world events, but if you, if you watch some of the, uh, the situations, either through BBC World News or NHK World or even Al Jazeera, you start to see um, the, the world is in a, in, a, in a terrible tumult. There's literally strife going on everywhere. I think except Australia, mind you, there might be a few people there that might be in strife right now, but, but people aren't really taking to the streets. Pastor Daryl might be, but he, you know, it's, it's one of those things. Um, apparently he has a permit to do so. The, the interesting thing about Jude is that um, the, uh, the parallels, we can draw a lot of, of comfort from that. And, and it's something I think to just stop and to take notice of the simplicity of this one chapter um, and how much is actually in it. Uh, we'll start reading in uh, Jude chapter one, verse one. It says, Jude, the servant of Jesus, or the servant of Jesus Christ and brother of James, to them that are sanctified by God, the Father and, um, and preserved in Jesus Christ and called. In verse two, he says, mercy unto you and peace uh, peace and love be multiplied. Now I'm reading, um, I'm reading uh, this with a, a lot of Greek uh, little symbols and stuff like right next to it. It's a, it's a little bit of a, of a challenge. It's a sort of a parallel version of the Bible. But what was very interesting was that um, Jude is 
um, Jesus' natural half-brother. Okay, so he is the, the, the brother of James, but he doesn't identify himself as, well, I'm, I'm pretty good because I know, uh, you know, Jesus was my brother and, and, you know, I'm pretty well known and I'm pretty famous and all of that sort of stuff. He really downplays the association, but he calls himself a servant of, of Jesus Christ. The word their servant is, is very interesting um, because the, the, first, um, the first actual definition of this is slave. And the other part of that is indentured servant. So an indentured servant was one that was usually somebody who had a big debt to pay off. And he would um, basically put himself into service in order to pay off the debt. And um, this is what James is ba or, or Jude is speaking of here. He's, uh, he's calling himself an indentured, indentured service of Jesus, servant of Jesus, that uh, Jesus paid that debt for him. And uh, it's, a, it's, it's a really quite, a, quite an interesting thing. I just sort of bringing that up. Chapter or verse two, uh, mercy unto you and peace and love be multiplied. And then verse three, we get to sort of some, some more meat in, in this as after the greetings are over. And he says, beloved, this is what came out in the gifts, ironically. Beloved, when I gave all diligence to write unto you of the common salvation, it was needful for me to write unto you and exhort you that you should earnestly contend for the faith which was once delivered unto the saints. So he's speaking here now. Well, there's, there's a little bit of speculation uh, that this could be written uh, 60 or 70 uh, A.D. all the way up to 95 A.D. We don't really know. There's, there's a whole bunch of little things and there's a, there's a whole bunch of speculation. But regardless of the day of writing, uh, a very short term, literally within a lifetime um, of the time when people saw Jesus walking, talking, teaching, when they saw him uh, baptized, when they saw the Spirit of God descending upon him like a dove, when they saw him healing the sick, opening the eyes of the blind, cleansing the lepers, healing the sick, doing all of those things that he did in a lifetime, when they saw him crucified, when they saw him rise from the dead, when they saw a group of them standing in a room, when Jesus walks into the room without opening the door, yet they could touch him and he could eat a piece of fish and honeycomb. In a, in a, in a time when, when all of this was still relatively no, good knowledge, when people understood and knew these things, James, or sorry, Jude, I apologize, is writing unto the church earnestly contend for the faith which was once delivered unto the saints. And it's a, it's a, it's a very telling warning. And he goes on to say in verse 4, For there are certain men who crept in unawares, who were before of old ordained to this, uh, this condemnation, ungodly men, turning the grace of our Lord God into lasciviousness and denying the only Lord God and our Lord Jesus Christ. He says, they look like Christians, but they aren't. And that's what Jesus warns us of when he talks about the, the, sheep, and, uh, the, the sheep and wolves clothing. He said they'll come looking like Christians. And it's a, it's a situation we all know. And, and we beat this one. This one uh, amongst us is almost what we would consider to be the old chestnut of a, of a saying amongst us. It's one of those things that we have to constantly remind ourselves because the world, as was also mentioned into the gifts, in the gifts today, the world is deceptive. We get drawn into the dramas. We get drawn into a lot of situations where we really, really don't want to belong. We don't want to deal with. We don't want to deal with the political uh, situation, but it's forced upon us abruptly. 
We don't want to deal with people's identifications of how they see themselves, but it's forced upon us by law, abruptly. And we start to cave because society starts to change our opinions on what is right and what is wrong. Jude is writing here of very similar situations that were happening because I can tell you in Jude's day, these things were happening to them too. When a, 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 a civilization was overtaken by Rome, people could keep their own identities, people could keep their own religions, except for Christians, and they could just be welcomed into the fold of Rome and be who they were and they didn't really have to change much. Just identify themselves to, to, to Rome and pay your taxes. Our situation is not unlike theirs. It's, a, it's, a, it's a, a, an incredible state of the world, as it were. We wouldn't have imagined when I came to the Lord 35 years ago, we would have thought it was pretty terrible then. We were hearing old pastors talking about the, the, the fact that society had gone downhill 1,000% from when they were younger. So I don't know what the, what the square root of all of this is. How far will we go? How far will it go? But Jude writing here in a sincere sort of simple message and a fairly blunt point He's basically calling out those that need to be put out of the church. I still remember one statement that was made by Billy Graham back in the 1950s. He said, it's about time that the church got out into the world. And one of our pastors took exception to that statement. And he said, if you don't mind, I think it's about time that we put the world out of our church. And all the people said, that's an old statement, but it's a true and, and, and honest one. Because this is, this is the stuff that we're, we're sort of fighting almost every day. And it's really interesting when you allow the news to come in. Facebook, Instagram, if you're on Twitter, all of the stuff that comes in, comes and bombards you on a daily basis. It's, it's really quite an amazing time. Verse 5. I will therefore put you in remembrance, though you once knew this, how the Lord, having saved the people out of the land of Egypt afterward, destroyed them that believed not. Well, praise the Lord, we have a, we have a good fellowship. And the, the, the necessity for a witch hunt here isn't, isn't uh, real. We don't require people to go out and look for those people that are are doing wrong in our fellowship because our, our fellowship is, is built upon simple um, ideas. It's biblical fact. It's based on what Jesus told us to do. And we're, we're basically keeping to the simple facts of the scriptures. And we don't have to worry uh, too terribly much about the fact that we're going to be condemned for things that we say or believe because we say and believe what's in the Bible. And once we start to digress from that, the warning is here. And we know some of our brother, brethren that uh, I, I can remember back looking and thinking back how shocked I was when we were going through old things about how many books of people who had once been in my life that are no longer in my life. And it's very, very telling and very, very interesting. And I don't know if you've all had the same experience about how there were significant groups of people in your life for a period of time, months, weeks, months, years, and then all of a sudden, you don't need their phone number any longer because they won't even speak to you, um, just simply because they have decided that uh, being filled with the Holy Ghost isn't that important, or being, uh, they, they, they would really like to go downtown on, on Friday night and have a few beers or they'd uh, really like to go see things that, uh, that are unedifying. And, and those, are the, those are the situations. And I'm talking about uh, heavy and blunt. Uh, we go on to verse 7. And even as Sodom and Gomorrah and the cities about uh, them in like manner, giving themselves over to fornication and going after strange flesh, are set forth as an example suffering the vengeance 
of eternal fire. And, and like I said, he doesn't, he doesn't mince words here. Likewise, also these filthy dreamers defile the flesh and despise dominion and speak evil of dignities. That means things that are good. But yet Michael, the archangel, when contending with the devil, he disputed about the body of Moses. He durst not bring a riling accusation against them, but said, the Lord rebuke thee. That came out in the gifts as well. This is a, this is a fantastic talk because it's a, it's a summary of the voice gifts of the spirit today, because it's really interesting how much of it was actually in there. And this is, um, this is just, just heavy, but it's good stuff. All the people said. Oops, I lost my place here. But these speak evil of those things which they know not. But they know naturally as brute beasts and those things. Uh, they and in those things they corrupt themselves. It says, woe unto them. For they have gone in the way of Cain and ran greedily after the error of Balaam and of course, we know the error of Balaam was to encourage the people of Israel to, uh, to, to basically be immoral. And for the reward, uh, and for their reward, or, sorry, and for reward, or, sorry, I'm going to read that again, ran greedily after the error of Balaam for reward and perished in, gain, in the gainsayings of Korah. And he was, of course, the one that stood up against Moses and wouldn't take Moses' authority. Verse 12, these are the spots in your feasts of charity when they feast with you, feeding themselves without fear. Clouds they are, without water, carried about of, uh, carried about of winds, trees whose fruit withered without fruit, twice dead and plucked up by the roots. It's, um, it's quite graphic in its in its imagery which Jude uses here but it's uh, that's that's basically what um, the people are because it's a uh, it's an interesting thing we um, we have just that simple stand when we have been introduced to the author of life when we've been introduced to through God's spirit the the wisdom and we have truly tasted that which is good of the Lord. All of a sudden, the dead tree, the old dead bones are revived. And we're given a new identity. We're given a new life. And it's, a, it's something that we rejoice about. Regardless of what's going on in the world now. Regardless of all of those people who can get us down. Of all of the situations that come against us. The rough neighbors that tell you off in the driveway. Uh, for no reason, there's a little flake of snow flipped over onto their side or something like that. There's a, there's a lot of things that can come at us in our life. But the greatest thing that we have um, is, is, uh, is what the Lord gave us through the Spirit. We have a family that we rely on. And um, he, he goes on to sort of uh, talk about them for quite a while because I think he was, on a, he was on a little bit of a rant. Something, there was a whole bunch of things going on uh, in the church. He gets to the but in verse 20. But ye beloved, building up yourselves in your most holy faith, praying in the Holy Ghost, keep yourselves in the love of God, looking for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ unto eternal life. In verse 22, and of some have compassion, making a difference. Now, the interesting thing about this, these couple of statements here, in verse 22 and 23, he's talking about the people he was just ranting about. So on some have compassion, making a difference, and others save with fear, pulling them out of the fire, hating even, hating even the garments spotted by the flesh. And then verse 24, now him that is able to keep you uh, from falling and to present you faultless before the presence of, of uh, his glory with exceeding joy, 
to the only wise God, our Savior, be glory and majesty, dominion and power, both now and forever. Amen. So there's a, there's a lot of, of uh, information in Jude. And like I said, it's one of the most blunt points. But out of it, we get some, some of the best encouragement going. To earnestly contend for that faith that was once delivered unto the saints. We keep ourselves in the love of God by doing so. We build ourselves up in the holiest of faith to overcome all of the things that come against us. And we, through that, have the ability uh, to, to save some with fear in preaching and others we have compassion making a difference. And this is a, I think if you were to, to sort of put it all down, Jude, Jude writes a really good talk because he's, uh, he's his, the, 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 the single um, verse or the single chapter that he has here has uh, just an enormous amount in it. And it's, uh, it's really good for, I guess, for all of us to just consider um, in all days. So all the people said.